Uh, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Madeline Fitzgerald and I am the manager of public programs here at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. On behalf of the museum, I would especially like to welcome and thank our members who are watching tonight. It's because of your generosity that our collection and our special exhibitions are free and open to everyone. If you are not currently a member, I encourage you to join by visiting our website at cartermuseum.org. The exhibition Acting Out, Cabinet Cards and the Making of Modern Photography is supported in part by the Alice L. Walton Foundation Temporary Exhibitions Endowment. We would like to give a special thanks to the foundation for making this exhibition possible. If you are looking for more Acting Out programming, please join us virtually on Sunday, October 25th for the Carter's Art Mashup Program. Art Mashup occurs on the fourth Sunday of each month, September through November, and is at these programs where we redefine what art means as we bring you a mashup of different things and creative activities. This fall, we're going virtual with fun ways to explore the Carter online or during your next visit. For the October Art Mashup, we'll be virtually exploring all things photography in connection to the Acting Out exhibition. No reservations are necessary for the day and the program is completely free. So you can visit cartermuseum.org to learn more. Uh, this evening, we will hear from three lovely speakers. Uh, the plan is for John Rohrbach to introduce our two guest speakers in just a second. Uh, and after all three of their presentations, we'll do a, a combined Q&A session. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Zoom webinar format, uh, feel free to submit a question by using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see uh, the options of Q&A uh, and chat and raise hand. Uh, we're not going to be raising hands and having you guys turn your cameras on. It gets really complicated, um, but you can submit a question through the Q&A option. Uh, that's the easiest way for us to manage it. And if you have any questions um, about the, the technical aspect of the evening or some clarifications, uh, feel free to submit questions through the, the um, chat function. Uh, I'll be managing and monitoring both the Q&A and the chat during the presentation. So just let us know if you have any questions. Um, and with that, I will open up the virtual floor to John Rohrbach, the Carter's Senior Curator of Photographs. Thank you. Let me pull up a screen here. I'm so sorry we can't all be together. I'm John Rohrbach, Senior Curator of Photographs at the Amy Carter Museum. And settle in with your wine or your water or your gin or your juice, we have a great program for you. As Madeline's pointed out, this evening's program is presented in conjunction with the museum's current exhibition, Acting Out, Cabinet Cards in the Making of Modern Photography. Um, and as the screen suggests, the show is at our museum through November 4th, or November 1st, excuse me, and then goes on to the Los Angeles County Museum where, where it will be presented next spring and summer. Before I introduce Aaron Powell and, and Britt Salveson, I'd like to thank the museum for funding the project and allowing us to move through with it, with the support of the Alice uh, Walton Foundation. Um, I recognize that some of you are a little bit cautious about traveling to Fort Worth these days, but if you do come before November 1st, you'll see the excellent work of our exhibitions designer, Tim Smith, and our art preparation staff, Tom Walsh, led by Tom Walsh. Now curators often have sort of a basic sense of what an exhibition will look like early in the process, but to see this show come to physical fruition in such elegant and engaging form is a delight for me, and I hope it would be for you. I also want to thank Amanda Freeman of the University of California Press for the fine book that they produced in conjunction with the project. The book wouldn't be what it is without the support of Daniel Curley, which allowed us to produce all 120 cabinet cards shown in the exhibition not only at full size, but in full color. 
our editor publisher, Will Gillum, expertly saw into all details of the book's production. Though, of course, what makes the book have lasting value are the engaging essays of Powell's, Salveson, and the key technical synopsis provided by our conservator of photographs, Fernando Valverde. One other important note, our museum is one of those rare entities that's open free to the public. We thus rely on the revenue of our members and our supporters for what we do. We get some support in part through the generosity of donors, members, the city of Fort Worth, the Texas Commission of the Arts through the Arts Council of Fort Worth and the Fort Worth Tourism Public Improvement District. But we really rely on all of you. So if you're not a member, shame on you, please join. You can do so quite simply. Go to our website, cartermuseum.org, and push that join button in the upper right of the opening page. For those of you who don't know about cabinet cards, they're modest in size. They're five and a half by four inch photographs, each mounted on its own cardstock measuring six and a half by four and a quarter inches. Now these sizes may seem tiny compared with what you're used to seeing in museums these days, but think for a moment how satisfied you are with your cell phone screens. Cabinet cards are larger. Introduced in London in 1866, they appear to have gained their name from the ease for which they could be put onto bookshelves and fill cabinet shelves. Marketed for just a few dollars a dozen, they became the common format for photographic portraiture, particularly over the last two decades of the 19th century. Like most of my colleagues, I didn't pay much attention to them until around 2016, when Seattle collector Robert E. Jackson coaxed me into coming out and looking at his holdings. He then helped open to the door for, to my seeing Hans Lorenz's extensive collection on the East Coast with the help of Hans's wife, Pam. Between those two collections, I was hooked, as I hope you too will be by this evening's end. I thank them for that entree. Aaron Powells is assistant professor at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University a historian of American art with a PhD from the University of Indiana. Her research focuses on the intersection of elite and popular forms of expression across the 19th and early 20th century and the transcultural circulation of images. Her about to be published book, Napoleon Cerrone and the Art of Living Pictures, examines that very intersection, high and low art. She's also published on portraiture, celebrity culture, the history of American theater in journals like American Art, Panorama, and History of Te and Technology. And she's provided an essay to the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery's 50th anniversary volume, Beyond the Face, New Perspectives on Portraiture. Today, she'll share with us some of her deep knowledge about Napoleon Cerrone. Britt Salveson, is curator and head of the Wallace Annenberg Photography Department and Prints and Photographs Department, Prints and Drawings Department, excuse me, at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She gained her MA from the Courtauld Institute of Art and her PhD from the University of Chicago. Prior to coming to LACMA, she worked at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Milwaukee Art Museum, and the Center for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona, where she was director in chief her many distinguished projects since coming to LACMA include exhibitions on Robert Maplethorpe, Katie Grannon, and Ed Boucher, shows on German and Mex Mexican cinema, and most recently, her project 3D, Double Vision. Today, she's generously agreed to speak on the business of cabinet cards. Now again, first Aaron will speak, followed by Brett, and then I'll come back and share a few thoughts myself. Please add your questions to the question and chat functions, and we'll address them as many as we can. Excuse me, we'll address as many of them as we can at the end of our presentations. Thanks. 
Karen. Thank you so much, John. And um, thanks also to Madeline and to the folks at Eamon Carter for organizing this rare opportunity to celebrate what's often an overlooked moment in American photographic history. One reason the Acting Out exhibition is so special is that cabinet card photographs can be difficult for 21st century uh, viewers to appreciate. Their subjects engage in oddly performed behaviors, pretending to ice skate, to paint, or play chess in awkwardly contrived studio settings. These pictures resemble everyday life, but um, from our contemporary perspective, they still seem to be strangely out of touch with reality. This is in part because today photography is so completely integrated with our everyday lives. Nearly everyone has a camera in their pocket and we use them to document everything from important family gatherings to uh, pet antics and just very good meals. Um, in this current media climate, it can be difficult to remember that photography once required mastery of cumbersome equipment and slow exposure times. And that until cameras could be brought up to speed with everyday life, the best solution was often to restage normal activities um, in a professional photographer's studio. Keeping this in mind can help us to read cabinet cards more charitably, allowing us to see their visual quirks, not as flaws, but as symptoms of photography's somewhat awkward adolescence, as the medium moved closer to its modern cultural function. These growing pains also created artistic opportunity, however, uh, as the theatricality of cabinet cards opened space for creative experimentation that helped the public to see how photography could be used as a tool for art. No American photographer of the cabinet card era more fully embraced this mingling of art and artifice than Napoleon Cerrone. Born in Quebec in 1821, Cerrone was once the most famous name in American photography. And during the last three decades of the 19th century, his grand studio on Union Square was a New York City landmark. At the peak of his activity in the 1880s, Cerrone estimated his studio produced more than 1,000 cabinet cards per day and that over the course of his three decade career, he took more than 200,000 photographic portraits. However, if you've never heard the name Cerrone before, you are hardly alone. Though he was revered by his contemporaries as the father of artistic photography, um, he was also an avid self promoter and extremely commercially minded. And in later years, this fact came to eclipse his weightier artistic accomplishments. My forthcoming book, however, argues that Cerrone's significance to the art of photography is inseparable from his entrepreneurial bombast. His career coincided with the birth of American celebrity culture, and his claims to artistry were deeply informed by this logic of public visibility. His studio was distinguished from neighboring buildings by a one-story high marquee that reproduced his signature in gigantic golden letters. The same logo appeared in miniature on uh, the lower margin of each of his cabinet cards. And at the same time, Cerrone used self-portraiture to uh, construct an eccentric public image that, he, that matched the swagger of this autograph. Known for his outrageous fashion sense, he disguised his working class immigrant roots by transforming himself into a variety of fantastic characters, picturing himself in a red tasseled fez and military uniform as you see here or a Canadian dandy in a fur vest and cap, or in a velvet beret and ruff to fashion himself as a modern old master. These outfits were not reserved for photographs either, um, but were also something that Cerrone wore regularly on the street, making the famous photographer, according to contemporary observers, one of the requisite sights to see when visiting New York City. Welcoming this attention, most afternoons, Cerrone and his glamorous wife, Louie, would promenade up and down Fifth Avenue dressed in fabulously unconventional outfits, and using the notice they receive, would lure potential portrait subjects back to the photographic studio. The Cerrone waiting room was a sight in itself, crammed with a museum's worth of curiosities, paintings, sculptures, and mummies, all of which were guarded over by a taxidermied crocodile that was suspended from the ceiling. What can be easy to overlook within all this spectacle is that Cerrone was also a precocious and fervent champion for the artistic potential of photography. In 1881, he told an interviewer that he believed the camera was a tool for creative expression, just like a paintbrush or a pencil, and that his goal as a photographer was to make pictures out of himself, 
to group a thousand shapes that crowded his imagination. To this end, Cerrone's vibrant public image mattered, not simply to the bottom line of his business, but because it reinforced his visibility as an artistic individual behind his popularly circulated photographs. At a time when many believed that a camera could only reproduce reality, Cerrone used his signature, his self-image, and his bold claims to make himself an unforgettable part of the portrait process. Imaginatively constructed studio pictures like his self-portrait in the snow, which you see here, demonstrated to a skeptical public that photography could transform reality as well as reproduce it by positioning Cerrone as the embodiment of its inventive potential. And in this spirit, it is important to glimpse the contrast that existed between Cerrone's photographic and real life selves. Though he appears tall and imposing in most of his self portraits, he was in reality of unusually short stature, just under five feet tall. He also was almost completely bald, had conspicuously bowed legs and a large crooked nose that he earned through a youthful enthusiasm for boxing. In his photographs, however, he disguised these physical attributes so successfully with wigs, costumes, and strategic posing that many contemporary observers expressed shock the first time they met him in person, um, a fact that underscored the magic of the medium in the hands of this skilled artist. Given his own dramatic self-presentation, it's not surprising that Cerrone excelled in making photographs of actors. His method in the studio was inspired by dramatic practice and designed to encourage the appearance of active performance. Though it is important to realize that while his photos might easily be mistaken for shots in a theater, uh, they were all actually staged using sets that were specially constructed for use in the photographic studio. Like many 19th century photographers, Cerrone worked beside the camera rather than behind it. He employed assistants to manage the hands-on work of developing negatives and making prints, while he devoted himself to the more visionary aspects of his job. After choosing a backdrop and props, he would focus his full attention on the person before the camera, coaxing them into the desired expression while cueing his trusted camera operator when to start and end exposures. This division of labor freed Cerrone to treat portrait making as a kind of performative collaboration with his role as photographer being something like a stage or film director, working to orchestrate an event that was specially produced for the eye of the camera. His intense personal investment with these portraits was a much publicized aspect of studio lore. One frequently published story involved a series of photographs taken in, 19, in 1868 of the Italian actress Adelaide Ristori in the role of Marie Antoinette. The session reportedly began like any other, with the actress in costume performing scenes, um, scenes from her play atop an elevated posing platform that allowed maximal illumination from the skylights above. Once the posing session was underway, however, studio assistants described how Cerrone and Ristori seemed to en enter a kind of shared trance. As the actress performed and the photographer encouraged, the pair became increasingly absorbed in the reenactment of Marie Antoinette's final moments. At the height of her story's performance, the actress tore the costume wig and bonnet from her head and threw them to the ground, where they remained visible in the lower portion of the photograph. Electrified by what he saw, Cerrone forgot momentarily that he was on the elevated platform beside her story and toppled headfirst onto the floor with a crash, shattering the spell that had gripped the studio as the actress and gathered onlookers erupted into laughter. Asked about it later, Cerrone claimed only that he recalled the powerful communion that had existed between himself and his subject in that moment, saying, why I actually saw Marie Antoinette before me and not her mimic. I have the negative to prove it. Though on its surface, this statement sounds a little as if he may just have been addled from his recent fall off a platform. I think it also demonstrates the shrewd promotion of Cerrone's larger goals that were embedded in this well-publicized incident. Cerrone exploited the popular appetite for celebrity gossip to give vibrancy to a series of static pictures, using the opportunity to explain his working method and position and to position the images as proof of his ability to balance photography's mechanical characteristics with his own almost magical powers of artistic transformation. Early in his career, Cerrone was assisted in achieving this balance by a device known as the Cerrone posing apparatus that had been invented by his brother Oliver in 1866. The Cerrone device was intended as an improvement on the rigid metal posing stands you see here, 
which had been used in photo studios since the 1840s to prevent subjects from moving and blurring images during long exposure times. They gripped sitters at the back of the head with a single iron clamp that often was a poor fit for small children or larger adults. And they were so notoriously uncomfortable that they came to be nicknamed iron instruments of torture by those who spent a photo session in their clutches. The Cerrone posing apparatus, by contrast, boasted multiple branching arms that could be customized to fit any body. And whereas traditional bases, braces were best suited to upright standing and seated positions, the Cerrone stand could be easily adapted to accommodate an array of animated poses, as the Cerrone brothers illustrated with an accompanying series of gridded photographic studies. Now, the capabilities of the Cerrone stand had obvious advantages when it came to making portraits of portraits of performers in action, and the device no doubt helped to cement Cerrone's position as the leading theatrical photographer in New York. What is interesting, however, about trying to study this thing is that, like a lot of the creative labor involved in 19th century portrait photography, it was designed to remain invisible. So its effects can really only often be observed when comparing Cerrone's work with that of his contemporaries. And so I show you on the left, a photograph by Jeremiah Gurney of the ballet dancer Rita Sangali, and she, and using a standard posing, sta um, a standard posing stand, um, she assumes a static position. Um, while the adjustable arms of the Cerrone posing apparatus allowed her to be photographed on point, better representing the experience of seeing her live in the theater by allowing her to more fully approximate her physical abilities in front of the camera. Similarly, it was most likely Cerrone's posing stand that allowed Edwin Booth to be portrayed in the role of Iago, stalking toward an unseen Desdemona with malice in his eyes. In a contemporary photograph by Jeremiah Gurney, as you see on the left, he adopted a similarly sinister sneer, but his upright position does little to embody the part or document the animation of his onstage performance. A rare example of the posing stand actually in action um, is in Cerrone's 1874 portrait of Dion Boussico in the Chagrone. The picture appears to capture a fleeting moment of activity um, as the actor leans back precariously over the edge of a cliff. But with exposure times of several seconds, it's extremely unlikely that this action was as spontaneous as it appears. And indeed, close observation reveals the presence of the posing apparatus peeking out just below um, Boussico's left arm and holding him steady even as the drama of his portrait otherwise ec eclipses its presence. Regardless of when or how such devices were employed, what these images demonstrate is that the more successful Cerrone was in solving the technological problems of period photography, the less likely his efforts were to be seen and appreciated. His studio backdrops were another kind of easily overlooked tool that he used to translate the drama of the stage to the studio to bring life to his photography. Cerrone's 1875 portraits of the actress Clara Morris in the popular melodrama, The Statue, for example, show how he altered these painted canvases on the spot to meet the expressive needs of a particular photograph. The portraits evoke the play's climax when Morris's character had been imprisoned and appealed to the spirits of her ancestors to preserve her virtue. Contemporary reviews tell us that in the theater, the scene took place in front of a monumental statue, hence the play's name. But in Cerrone's composition, he poses the actress in a virtually empty space, amplifying her emotional performance by doubling her figure with a dark shadow cast crisply upon the wall. Although it appears natural enough, this effect could not have been, would not have been possible to achieve in an unelectrified studio using 1870s photographic technology. If we overlay the two photographs upon one another, we can see that Cerrone bridged this technological problem by relying on more traditional artistic means. Even as Morris's body position changed between the two shots, her shadow remains unmoved, revealing that it was most likely painted on the faux wall rather than created through some kind of projection. What is important about this type of observation is that it underscores the unseen labor that's invested in every cabinet card photograph. Acts of creative ingenuity, some more successful than others, that photographers employed to expand the representational capacity of their medium. Because these tricks are no longer familiar to us, they can be difficult for viewers to appreciate and in, unless we take the time to learn how to see them. 
Cerrone devoted much of his career to persuading his public to notice these efforts by asserting the dignity and artistic value of his unseen studio work. What later generations have interpreted as relentless self-promotion through self-portraits and newspaper interviews might also be interpreted in this light as an effort to communicate this message. And the fact that over time we have lost the tools to see what he was trying to show us perhaps demonstrates how necessary this persistent visibility once was. In the 19th century, however, Cerrone's efforts contributed to growing public appreciation of photographic manipulation as a form of artistry. The idea achieved legal certification in 1884 with Cerrone's victory in the US Supreme Court copyright case of Burrow Giles Lithographic Company v. Cerrone, which established the first legal precedent for the recognition of photography as a fine art. The lawsuit arose when a lithographic company reproduced without permission one of Cerrone's photographs of the poet and playwright Oscar Wilde, making it the basis for a department store advertisement. When Cerrone sued for breach of copyright, the lithographic company did not bother to deny they had used his photograph, since it was pretty obvious that they had. Instead, they challenged his claim on more fundamental terms. They argued that a photograph could not be copyrighted at all because it contained no original content. After all, they reasoned Cerrone had not invented Oscar Wilde, he had simply reproduced his likeness. What the lithographic company did not anticipate, however, is that Cerrone had devoted his entire career to building a case against this very argument. He countered that while he had no wish to claim he created Oscar Wilde, he did insist on being recognized as the inventor of the author's well-known public image. And the link between Wilde's celebrity and Cerrone's portraits is complex, um, but it is not a stretch in my opinion to say that these photographs helped to invent Oscar Wilde or at least to indelibly shape his public image. Only 28 years old and a newly published author, Wilde was scarcely known in the United States when Cerrone created these photograph photographic portraits at the start of a year long lecture tour. As Wilde's celebrity grew, so did demand for his image. In addition to the thousands of cabinet cards printed by Cerrone's studio, tens of thousands of unauthorized copies were snapped up by eager fans. The widely circulated pictures were the basis for most 19th century mass media images of Wilde, and even today remain Cerrone's best known and most frequently reproduced work. And in fact, if you've ever seen a photograph of Wilde, it is most likely one of Cerrone's. And should you be wondering if the success of these portraits might not be due only to the charismatic and fashionable wild, I would submit these two photographs to you as evidence. One taken by Cerrone and the other just two years later by Cerrone's fo former business partner, Robert Thrupp. Wilde's relative ease and grace in Cerrone's work on the left, the sophisticated way that he has been directed to engage the camera, underscores the undeniable artistry and unseen collaboration in the unseen collaboration between the photographer and portrait subject. In the end, the Supreme Court took this view as well, ruling in Cerrone's favor that his investment of creative labor in posing and staging his photograph elevated it from mere mechanical reproduction to a representation of what they described as ideas in the mind of an author given visible expression. Never one to shy from publicity, Cerrone celebrated his legal victory by inviting the entire US Supreme Court to his studio to pose for a group portrait. And while the resulting picture does not stretch reality so much as Cerrone's self-portrait in the snow or the other examples of cabinet cards that you may see in the wonderful acting out exhibition, it demonstrates the fundamental theatricality of this era in, photo in studio portraiture. Costumed in their judicial robes, the, the justices perform their professional roles for the camera in a setting that's staged to resemble an Italianate garden. And it can be easy to focus on the artifice of this historical photography and its difference from our own, but it's important too to recognize the creativity and playful enterprising spirit of this underappreciated, underappreciated generation of American photographers as they made what ultimately was a crucial step toward modern art. Thank you. I'll pass it over to Britt. Hello. Quick check, can you hear me? Great. 
Thank you. Today, I will talk to you about cabinet cards as a business proposition in the last quarter of the 19th century, since Aaron has just introduced the New York-based celebrity photography of Cerrone. I will focus on, um, on what life was like for commercial portrait photographers based outside large urban centers, how they set up their studios, drummed up business, defined their professional identities, and embedded themselves in their communities. Along the way, I'll mention various research strategies and sources, and I'll finish with a case study from California, where I'm speaking to you today from. Let's start with the cards themselves and all the information they offer about the business of photography during this period. <clears throat> As you look at cabinet cards, the first thing you might notice is the photographer's name and location printed along the lower margin. Cerrone, as we just heard, set a precedent in the US with his manner of emblazoning his surname in flamboyant calligraphy below the photograph, borrowing from um, some French examples, actually. This flashy typography was called the spread eagle style, and some commentators at the time criticized um, photographers for egotistically overshadowing the subject of the photograph with what amounted to advertising for themselves, much like the oversized logos we're used to seeing everywhere today. However, we historians can be grateful since these printed signatures tell us who made or published the photograph, even if we don't always know any longer who it depicts. For that, we might require handwritten inscriptions added by the sitter or a family member, as you can see here on the right of your screen. These reverse sides of cabinet cards provided even more generous field for promotion of the photographer's services and skills. And just as a note about, um, the making, photographs were printed by the photographer or assistants and then mounted by hand to the cards. The cards were printed by specialist printers, um, and here's an advertisement for one such printer, using entirely different methods such as letterpress, lithography, photo engraving, and later halftone. So it's a bit of an assembly line. On the backs of the cards, here are two more examples, you find a visual density of typefaces and patterns, phrases curving in all directions, decorative borders and banners, typical late Victorian style. Printers offered um, standard designs. Here you see um, some examples, templates and stock components, kind of like what we call clip art today. And these could be combined according to the client's specifications and indeed um, reused almost universally. Here, for example, you see um, three repetitions of this quasi-Renaissance, I think, um, illustration used by studios in um, Mississippi, Massachusetts, and Uruguay. Skilled local printers could produce depictions of specific buildings and locales, as well as more poetic renderings, um, such as this lovely tree trunk um, from Mr. Deming's photograph rooms in Connecticut. Photographers also use this space to signal their artistic aspirations. The word artist or its um, variations appears frequently, as do allegorical figures, puti, and palettes traditional signifiers for fine art, all available from printers' sample books. Alternatively, the photographer might portray himself as a prosperous modern businessman. Awards from competitions appear on many back mounts, indeed in such numbers that they read more as participation awards than anything truly meaningful to middle-class clientele. But the, the awards do often indicate professional affiliations. With um, pardon me, newly formed groups such as the Photographers Association of America, founded in 1880. Annual meetings of these groups drew attendees from large cities and small towns alike. Speakers offered business advice, technical tips, and discourses on the state of the field. Large exhibitions showcased award-winning work by members. So I guess they're the medals. Um, did have meaning. We know a lot about these groups through their journals. I'm showing you an example here, many of which fortunately are fully digitized and are really wonderful time capsules for us researchers. In these journals, you hear the voices of photographers across the country and even beyond expressing their aspirations and their anxieties. A preoccupation with ethics reflects the fact that the 
profession of commercial photographer was a relatively new one, having only emerged in the 1850s. From that early point, photographers um, made an effort to position their medium among the traditional arts um, and by extension, define themselves as artists. In the cabinet card era, a photographer might show off his camera or studio setup, giving customers a preview of the well-appointed, elegant surroundings they would encounter when posing for their own portraits. Such assurances might have been comforting to those who had had bad experience with disreputable itinerants or cheap jacks, as they were known, who produced poor quality work or even sometimes tried to pass off portraits of other people entirely. Photographers were recognizable enough figures that they appeared as characters in comic songs and on the popular stage. The posture of the highfalutin award-winning artiste whom we see in cabinet cards may appear exaggerated and a little comical to us, but should be seen as intended to counter suspicions about unscrupulous operators and also to convey skill and reliability. Photographers looking to establish themselves in a small town might begin with a portable cart or caravan type vehicle or even a train car and then aspire to rent the upper floor of a commercial building on Main Street and look at all those Main Street addresses in this typical city directory snippet. Ideally, they would want to have a roof skylight and um, the likelihood of some foot traffic. Key features of a studio were natural light and running water, indoor and outdoor space for processing, developing, and printing, and storage for materials, and a reception area. We have written descriptions, photographs, and even paintings from the period to tell us how reception areas were outfitted. Notice especially carpets and other textiles, furniture, and sample photographs displayed in albums and frames of various kinds. By this time, key materials like photographic negatives and papers were factory made, no longer had to be prepared by hand. Many other supplies could also be ordered from wholesalers. Therefore, we can refer to advertisements and mail order catalogs to get a sense of the investment required to set up a studio and run a business. It quickly becomes clear how many and varied were the other industries affiliated with photography's rise in popularity. We already talked about printers who supplied the card mounts. We can also consider painted backdrops. There were some dominant firms, notably Engelmann and Schneider in Dresden, Germany, and LWCV of New York, but other fabricators competed with those larger companies, as advertisements tell us. Some backdrops were simply gradated tones intended to produce what was called the Rembrandt effect. Uh, darker areas setting off a sitter's profile, lighter areas creating a sense of open space behind him or her. Other backdrops, like the one that's um, featured in the Eamon Carter exhibition, create a more elaborate, not to say um, always logical, illusions like this indoor-outdoor melange. As seen in the cards that John selected for the show, backdrops contribute so much to the charm of cabinet cards. They also helped the photographer achieve an even exposure since they were colored to complement the sensitivity of gelatin dry plate negatives. A similar fascinating subhistory could be traced for studio props, a uh, charming array of faux stumps, columns, gates, boulders, etc. They were usually made of paper mache and thus had little, little chance of survival, but we see them captured in printed advertisements and of course in the photographs. Foreground and background effects could also be added by the photographer after the fact, during the printing process, by deploying custom cut masks, borders, or multiple negatives. Let me just walk you through a trio here, where on the left you see an advertisement for a kind of a paper mache physical but fake um, um, cottage window. In the middle you see such a cottage window propped up in the studio. On the right, maybe uh, we're looking at a studio where they couldn't afford um, the paper mache cottage window, so they used a picture of one superimposed. So those are two different negatives. Once a studio was established, the challenge was to stay in business. 
We know that, like restaurants, studio premises and supplies would pass from one photographer to another as one went out of business and another stepped in to try their luck. Photographers had to be multitaskers, sometimes performing the duties of receptionist, retoucher, printer, mounter, or pressing family members into service for those tasks. Even if they did a brisk trade in cabinet card portraiture, most photographers also sold other photo-related items and formats like albums, frames, stereographs, and enlargements. Profit margins were perilously narrow. To attract customers, photographers offered coupons and quantity discounts, boasted about their new equipment, and planted tidbits about their doings in local papers. Not expecting you to read through all of this, I'll just draw attention to some of the um, words in the lower left clipping in which Mr. Oates is boasting about a nice reception room lady who would help ladies arrange their hair and drapery. Amid constant discussion in the journals about pricing, the average cost of a dozen cabinet cards hovered between three and five dollars per dozen, as I say, during the 20 years from 1880 to 1900. Just as a few points of comparison, um, a four and a half foot toboggan cost four dollars, a lady's bathing suit nine dollars, and monthly rent in a four room house in Camden, New Jersey was eight dollars. Even those who did well enough to rent premises on Main Street um, and charge at the upper end of the, of the scale um, were only one recession or fire away from bankruptcy. As a hedge, especially in smaller towns, it was not uncommon to pursue multiple professions like Dr. Lane of Pike, New York, photographer and dentist. Here you see um, Mrs. R.M. Brown in Belleville, Kansas, bartering her first class photographs for cords of wood. Classified ads like these were one means of local advertising. Displays in storefronts or inside general stores were another. A form of product promotion that is especially beguiling to us today is the banner lady who emerged in around the 1870s. These ladies festooned with products, could be tools or household goods, would march in parades and appear at trade shows. They were also photographed in their glory and thus the cards could be circulated as advertisements when they themselves weren't on the move. As uh, straight faced as some of these models appear, I think, uh, pardon me, I think everyone was in on the silliness of the trend and that seems especially apparent in these self-referential cases where photographs themselves are the product being sold. A more subtle product placement strategy had sitters posing with cabinet cards and other photo related products like this album, no doubt at the encouragement of the, the photographer who had many items ready to hand and for sale in the studio. More candid photographs made in real uh, domestic interiors show that people of the period did enjoy having quite a clutter of pictures around them, an array of photographs, prints, uh, samplers, what have you. This was part of the era's sensibilities. And um, to extend that point, there are stylistic commonalities between different types of items, as you can see in this array, from cabinet card backs to book covers, sheet music, Valentine's trade cards, more or less ephemeral paper goods manufactured by intertwined industries, all aimed at middle-class publics and their newly acquired taste for leisure, hobbies, and sociability. Ultimately, local photographers understood the desires of their communities and what they wanted to collect in exchange. Here's how the journal, The Philadelphia Photographer, summed it up in 1880. The outlook is most cheerful. There is more hope of making money than there has been. Competition is not so ugly. Our patrons are better informed and more appreciative. We are no longer ashamed to acknowledge ourselves as photographers. Our business is becoming a profession and an art. And we come in next to the minister and the doctor. Cheer up, do your best, and you will be glad and happy and meet your reward. I think those words nicely sum up the embeddedness of commercial portrait photographers in their communities. On that note, and in, my, in the last five minutes of my talk, I'd like to introduce the case study of Richard John Arnold operating in California close to the turn of the century, um, which demonstrates the challenges and the rewards of examining local histories aided by cabinet cards. 
Arnold was born in 1856 in Middlesex, England, and emigrated around 1872 to New York, where his older brother James was already working, living and working as a bookkeeper. We have this carte de visite portrait of RJ made in 1875 at Matthew Brady's famous studio in Washington, DC. Perhaps that's where Arnold was trained as a photographer. After about a dozen years on the East Coast, Arnold headed west to California and opened a photography studio in San Luis Obispo in 1886. His was one of an estimated 170 studios in California at this time, according to a tally published in 1885 and based on the 1880 census. This might seem a low figure to us today, but the perception of the time was, quote, there is scarcely a place of three or four houses and hardly a crossroad, crossroad, but has someone making cheap pictures, close quote. So there was already a lot of uh, visibility for photography. Arnold's few years, that is from about 1886 through around 1892 in San Luis Obispo, seemed to have left little trace, um, somewhat like this trace of his studio in a damaged negative. I'll flash forward to the 21st century when area resident Jacqueline de Marie approached the El Paso Robles Area Historical Society to offer the loan of 1400 glass plate cabinet size negatives. These turned out to be Arnold's portraits. First, the negatives required cleaning, which was carried out by volunteers under the guidance of archivist uh, brother Lawrence Scrivani. Then, Historical Society President Grace Pucci invited her nephew, Los Angeles-based photographer Anthony Lepore, to examine the results because he just happened to be visiting her house for Thanksgiving. And he loved what he saw and uh, selected a group of restored negatives to, to scan and print. And the resulting digital prints, which you can glimpse uh, behind them there, and um, I'm also showing you a, a larger example, reveal a diverse community on, central, on California's central coast. And because they aren't cropped for, uh, as they would have been for printing and mounting, you can glimpse some of the stagecraft, such as the edges of backdrops. And as here, you can see um, on, the, on our left, the helping hand reaching in to prop up that plant. Like so many of the local operators I described earlier, Arnold took portraits of, city, of sitters in his studio. Uh, card mounts place him at the town center, um, uh, first on Monterey Street and then on Morrow Street, which intersect um, toward the lower left of this fire insurance map. Arnold also made larger group portraits out of doors and in workplaces. His sitters included African American, Asian American, and Latino residents, all making lives for themselves in San Luis Obispo, whose population increased 25% between 1880 and 1890. Founded back in 1772 by Father Junipero Serra and one of California's earliest mission statements, the town was historically a cattle ranching area, um, hence the butcher, um, augmented in 1880s and 90s by Chinese laborers who came to build the Pacific Coast Railway. When Arnold was working there, SLO still had a reputation for violence and vigilantism, but his photographs reveal a future-facing populace eager to convey decorum and diligence. Arnold seems to have approached his own work in this spirit. The restored negatives show evidence of his being a competent retoucher, and his marginal notations of names, quantities, and inventory numbers indicate an organizational system and a clientele. With only these negatives to go on, we have an intriguing glimpse of a typical studio practice outside of an urban center. For reasons yet to be uncovered, Arnold moved north along the coast, first moving to Santa Barbara and Alameda before settling in Monterey in 1901 and taking over a studio there. We find him participating in photography exhibitions in, in the first decades of the 20th century. By the time he died in Monterey in 1929, his San Luis Obispo cabinet cards must have been distant memories, at least for him. We can imagine they were still treasured by the children and grandchildren of the sitters. As John noted, the cabinet card format um, was eclipsed in the early 20th century. It was not succeeded by yet another size, but really by an entirely different approach to the photographic medium. When George Eastman came out with an easy to use roll film camera in 1900 and marketed it to amateurs along with mail-in processing service, people could take their own portraits in their own homes and at their own special occasions. 
Looking back at cabinet cards from the latter 19th century, we can imagine all these lives lived, all these interactions between photographers and sitters, all these testaments to community and family ties. Thank you to the Emmy Carter for this invitation and to all of you up there for your kind attention. And now I will pass the mic back to John Warbach. John, I think you're muted. I'm mute. There we go. There we go. Sorry for the delay. Um, what do you grab first in times of fire or flood or in the aftermath, at least in Texas, of tornadoes? Why are our phones filled with so many images of ourselves, our pets, our friends, every life detail? When my mother died a couple of years ago, my siblings asked me to take in all the family photographs. My role would be to sort them, make digital copies, and share them with the rest of the family. Against my better judgment, I said yes, but with a caveat that I wouldn't be able to get to them until after I retired. This was before I saw what was there. I ended up filling a dumpster with photographs and still sending 12 moving boxes of them back to Fort Worth. I kept only those images of our immediate family letting go of all my parents' travels and their events with friends. But I still have at least three or 4,000 photographs to sort through. Why do we have this compulsion to photograph every detail of our lives and then hold on to all these photographs? It wasn't always this way. As Britt pointed out, most of Richard John Arnold's customers seek to project decorum and diligence. They probably didn't visit photographic studios very often, perhaps getting their portraits made just once or a couple of times over their lifetimes. The same controlled seriousness was common to photography across much of the 19th century. Within the medium strictures of long exposure times, which were generally a couple of seconds at best, and emotions that were overly blue sensitive, the goal was simply to get an acceptable record. And most people were not particularly happy with the results, even, even though and even as they had to admit that photographs are beguiling in their realism and detail. Think back 20 years, the time before most people had ever heard of the World Wide Web, the time before cell phones, in 1859, a mere 20 years after photography's introduction, this country was so inundated with photographs and photographers that the distinguished Boston, excuse me, Boston physician and cultural critic and amateur photographer Oliver Wendell Holmes mused in print about how difficult it was to remember a time before photography. Little did he know that almost immediately Americans would be swept up by a new fad of acquiring tiny business card sized photographic portraits of themselves, their family, and their friends. One couldn't see very much in these cards to the seed as they were called after their French origins, but one could see enough. So that's what Aunt Betsy and Uncle Franklin looked like. Soon, Holmes was calling them the greenbacks of civilization. But the fad dissipated. Once people had filled their specially slotted albums, one or two portraits of yourself and your family members was enough, unless you moved or were off at war and needed to reassure the folks back at home that you were still alive. It was one thing to collect multiple portraits of public personalities, but who needed two portraits of Uncle Franklin? By 1866, a growing recession in picture making had left photographers and suppliers floundering for solutions. In stepped Edward L. Wilson, editor and publisher of the National Journal, The Philadelphia Photographer. Learning about a new format called cabinet cards being promoted in, Lon in the London press, Wilson reiterated that campaign almost word for word. 
the American photographic community, he said, should create a new fashion, recognizing that cabinet cards were three times larger and a bit wider than carts to the seat. He argued that the new format not only allowed one to see more detail, but that it had more pleasing proportions. Finally, he explained to his photographer subscribers that cabinet cards could be produced at almost the same cost as carts to the seat, yet sold for a lot more because of their increased size. Yes, the larger negative demanded more skill, including the need to touch out blemishes and other defects, but that was good for the trade. All that was needed was for photographers to band together, embrace cabinet cards, making sure they ignored all the other competing sizes so as not to confuse the public. Remember the debates about whether to go for Betamax or VCF, VCX? Then all they needed to do, Wilson said, was place a few cabinet card portraits in their windows and their waiting rooms and the customers would flock in. Unfortunately, much to the photo, girl, photo world's chagrin, it took more than a decade for photographers and customers alike to understand and embrace cabinet cards. In a world where portraiture may, meant recording likenesses, most customers looked to getting their portraits made as a one and done chore. Photographers had to figure out how to coax customers into coming back. One way to do that was to convince people that rather than look at photographs as records of appearance, they needed to see how they could be reflections of the moment. And here's where Cerrone was so important. As Aaron has just pointed out, he was a genius at uh, knowing exactly how to position people aided in some cases by his patented body brace, and when to open the shutter to produce a blended sense of personality and immediacy. It helped, of course, that many of his clients were theatrical stars, and the people that in those days, and that people in those days, collected cabinet cards of such figures with the same fervor that I did baseball cards in the early 1960s. But how many photographers could afford Cerrone's patented braces? And how many had the, his acuity for faking the instant? Remember, exposures were a couple of seconds. As Britt has just pointed out, small town photographers who by the 1880s would mark the heart of the cabinet card trade offered all sorts of incentives to get customers to come in, including an array of overlays, props, backdrops. Their goal was to make the experience, if not fun, at least a little more palatable. All these accoutrements helped individualize the portrait experience. If on one day you wanted to present yourself as a fisherman by the beach, another day you might embed yourself in the spokes of a bicycle, just like the one you had just purchased for yourself or surround yourself and a friend with a By the 1880s, the proliferation of factory produced su supplies, cabinet card stocks and, ca and cabinet card paraphernalia had, been had become the root of a solid business plan for many small town photographers. And in fact, many of the photographers featured in the acting out project stayed in business for decades. To be clear, the vast majority of cabinet cards are rather staid. They generally show a vignetted face or torso or a figure solemnly sitting and standing before the camera. If they have backdrops, these components are often overexposed. It's little wonder seeing these cards that the photograph that photographic historians have largely ignored the whole phenomenon. These sitters may project dignity and standing, but they lack personality. Yet there was a wide undercurrent of cards, often created by small town photographers, many across the upper Midwest, that are far more engaging. Now four, four factors generated these imaginative portraits. First and foremost, 
was the increased size and wider proportion of the cards. These attributes allowed one not only to see the kind of dress someone wore, but its detailing. It also allowed sitters to be situated not merely within spaces, but thanks to props, within tableaus. A second contributor to this new outlook, of course, was the backdrops, props, and overlays. These tools allowed, allowed photographers to individualize portraits. Here, dignity was replaced with pleasure. A third factor was the, the country's wide array of factories churning out ready-made clothing, furniture, toys, and all sorts of housewares, and the growing national network to get goods from one place to another with increasing efficiency. Over these years, a middle class was rising with increasing free time, money to spend, and a susceptibility to marketing. People always have wanted to keep up with the Joneses. Now they could show off their material well-being. Why show your new baby sitting in its mother's lap when you could prop it amusingly in a scale or in your fancy new wrought iron baby gear? The fourth factor is psychological. Rather than think of photographs as records of appearance, some photographers and their city sitters alike began to think of them as reflections of moments in time. Cabinet cards were the perfect keepsakes for a culture that celebrated family, children, and home as a refuge, refuge from the corruptions of the workplace. What better way to celebrate family then, by record, than by recording every aspect and every key event of the successes of life? Interestingly, family albums filled with cabinet cards seem to be rare. I have not yet seen an album assembled by one family that is filled with the kind of variety and fun that so attracted me to cabinet cards. But then my study has largely drawn from the vernacular market, where most cards have already been divorced from their originating context. I have found one instance where I can trace the same person across at least a short expanse of her life. Carolyn Hughes Hannum, we can see from the upper left to the lower right, moving from ages nine to 14. Yet it's clear that studio photographers documented people at all stages of their lives and that there are thousands, even tens of thousands of cards where people invite us into their comfortable worlds filled with family, friends, and stuff. One would never know, looking at all these cards, that this was a period of severe cultural and economic dislocation, a period of intermittent financial panics, punctuated by late uh, wage cuts, labor strikes, and high unemployment. In an America increasingly focused on an urban life, the prevalent atmosphere pervading many of these cards is an idealized rusticity presented in the form of country estates and tropical greenery. Cabinet cards are not for facing the day or for taking, they're for taking a moment out of it, for finding a moment of comfortable relaxation. We see children and their pets, and pets alone. We even see people celebrating modest everyday events, like a morning's fishing excursion, or the proud purchase of a new lawnmower. We see cabinet cards documenting all facets of life, graduations, dating, marriage, jobs, friendships, even reunions. The elaborate posing on this card on the right makes me start to wonder how much watermelon juice and seeds spilled onto these women's dresses as they waited for the exposure to take place. The scene seems a bit formal for such a messy snack. The photographs of people posed with the tools of their trade were a common motif from photography's earliest days. But the range of occupations shown in cabinet cards seem to be far wider, encompassing more both working class subjects and professional trades from barbers to doctors. 
And the poses are far more often elaborate, including incorporating not merely one or two props, but a whole setup as you see on the left. Modest wealth meant free time. Free time meant hobbies, like collecting books, riding a motorcycle, or excuse me, riding a bicycle, painting, or roller skating. All things to be celebrated in cabinet. So the backdrops, as you see here, sometimes seem to have very little relationship to the presentations in front of them. They at least add atmosphere. We're a long way from carte de visite. The small town's photographer's role was no longer merely to record appearance and convey stature. It was to help people enjoy themselves. Status and stature may have been the goal and the result of many sittings, but I come away amazed at how many cards show people fooling around. It was only one short step from such joking around to full scale performance. Now, stereo cards had established a solid culture of performance as early as the 1850s with large national manufacturers selling series of fictional, generally humorous narratives on subjects like the cuckolded husband or wife. Cabinet cards, though, localize that approach, allowing customers to make fun of themselves. The photographers and sitters joined in play to more serious ends, too. Now, who of you? would be open to inviting a photographer into your home to watch you dress for the day. And to what end? This isn't a stat about establishing character. A character perhaps, as photographic emulsion became more sensitive and electric lights started inching their way into studios, a new fashion for light-filled images gained momentum. Dropping exposures in some cases down to a mere second or even less. If the man dressing to go out is one result of this shift from extended time to momentary time, another is John McGarrity's presentation of 18 poses within a single cabinet card, including a shot in the lower left where the woman is moving her head. Looking at this card, I can easily imagine the photographer and his client in animated conversation. The pair could have been aware of early photo booths that were being introduced in Europe at the time, or they might have seen one of the kinetoscopes that were, simp that were just then being introduced in New York City. But it's just as likely that they simply had absorbed the new outlook where being and stature had given away to the moment. Now, once people started having fun Get with getting their portraits made. They jumped all over our penchant for believing what we see in photographs. Back in 1869, the Boston photographer William Mumbler was taken to court for making and selling photographs presenting spirits of the deceased hovering behind his sitters. If retouching could show snow or show someone out of the snowstorm, careful through a careful blending of multiple negatives. One could also show a woman watch herself read a letter or in the case on the left, a man selling shoes to himself. Clearly believability has given way to entertainment. Now take a closer look at the photograph on the right of the three girls who are playing catch. Or are they all the same person? Are any of them looking at the ball? What is real around there, around them and behind them? What's dimensional and what's flat backdrop? The more you look, the more confusing it gets. Then in 1900, everything changed again. As Britt has mentioned, Eastman Kodak Company introduced its brownie camera, pricing it for a dollar. The act shifted the balance in ways 
that even the introduction of roll film 12 years earlier had not. The Brownie, in tandem with Kodak's processing and printing opportunities, outweighed the loss of the better quality cameras and lenses used by studio photographers and their professional skills at composing, lighting, and printing. Suddenly, almost anyone could easily and inexpensively record whatever they wanted. The outlook of comfortable relaxation instigated by cabinet cards was reshaped once more, this time into something far more personal and haphazard, at least until Kodak's marketing department told us what to photograph. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank all three of you for your uh, wonderful presentations. And uh, I know I learned a lot. Um, we do have some questions, which is great. I've answered a couple already, um, but I thought we could start with, uh, we've got a few technical questions um, that we can start with. So open to, to the three of you, whoever wants to answer. Um, the first question we had again, on the technical side, is um, approximately what size were the negatives for cabinet cards? The negatives were the same size as the, as the final print oftentimes, but when you're starting to sandwich negatives together, people would cut negatives and, and put them together and reach, reshoot them, but generally they're the same size. Great, easy question. Um, another question we had was, do we have any information um, about who painted all of the uh, fantastic backdrops that were featured in the photos? Brit? I'll say a couple of words, but then I think maybe Aaron might know some, may, might know a little bit more about the kind of high-end or custom backdrops that Cerrone was using. They do come out of the tradition of theatrical stage backdrops. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know any names ready to hand, but actually I consulted a, um, a master's thesis written by a student at um, Ryerson University who has come through a lot of the advertisements, the patents, and so on. So some research has been done on that subject. Um, certainly what I've found in my research is that WCV, whose backdrop you had presented in your presentation, was one of the most active uh, painters of backdrops. Backdrops could, were things to be done or paintings to be made very quickly. They were sold for not very much money. Um, and, but CV, in his advertising, talked about having hundreds and hundreds of backdrops available for photographers to purchase. Right, CV's, CV's the person who comes to mind immediately, Lafayette W. CV, which is an amazing 19th century name just on its own. But he started out doing set design in the theater and quickly realized that he could make a lot more money if he became a specialist. And so thereafter he worked, he was one of Cerrone's exclusive suppliers. So Cerrone painted a lot of his own backdrops too. And I suspect, I suspect some photographers did that too. There were a lot of um, erstwhile artists in the group. Um, Great, and then one other technical question um, we have. Uh, what are some ways that cabinet cards were sold or distributed in America? Was it only through the photographer? Um, the person who submitted this question said that they recently read a book about the Belle Epoque in France, which mentioned in passing a type of chocolate bar that was sold that included a small card with a different celebrity's portrait that you could collect. Um, Aaron, you're so familiar with the theater culture of New York. Um, well, there, there were a number of different ways um, that you could get cabinet cards. And in, I know in 1881, the sales of celebrity photographs totaled a million dollars in New York City alone. 
Um, so you could buy them from a photographer's studio. They often had street level windows where they would display the latest pictures of famous people that they'd just taken. But they'd also be in theater lobbies. Um, and so you could buy, you could see Sarah Bernhardt on stage and then go out in the lobby and buy her cabinet card as a souvenir. Um, and then also through the mail, through the Anthony brothers, they had extensive mailing lists and there were street vendors and they were in stationary stores. It, it was really hard not to buy cabinet cards um, during those last two decades of the 19th century. They were really everywhere. This actually also touches on, I'm seeing a, um, a question pop up in the chat about were there traveling cabinet card photographers? And yes, there were. And they would also have cards for sale in addition to making portraits of, of people they encountered. You also had cabinet cards as frontispieces in those journals, some of those journals that, um, that I, I showed a picture of, and those were intended to be you know, good teaching examples or notable examples. So as Aaron and John have both said, they were uh, quite ubiquitous. Okay, we've also had a couple of questions about Soroni. So I figured we can kind of switch to that. Uh, one of the earlier questions during your presentation, what Aaron was, um, if Soroni was influenced by Matthew Brady. Can you speak to that? It's a, that's a great question. I mean, they're, they're actually exact contemporaries, um, both born in 1821 and both died. I think maybe Brady lived to 1897, um, but, but so exactly the same age, but they really represent different schools of American photography with Brady really being the pre-war years. Um, and, and he was still around in the, during Cerrone's career too. I think though that Cerrone was more influenced by French photographers, as, as, as Britt mentioned briefly, the signature on the bottom of Cerrone's cabinet cards, he, you know, he, he nicked that from Nadar. Um, and, and also um, Alphonse Desdari, uh, Cerrone wrote, so I think he was, he was a native French speaker um, he spent a lot of time in Paris and started his career in England. So I think European photographs were what he was looking at when he came back to the United States. Great. Um, another question about Cerrone. Uh, did the day books and business ledgers of Cerrone survive? I wish. Um, if anyone ever sees one, please call me. I would love to. <laughs> I'd love to know. I've seen a few pages from some uh, catalogs. There, there were often um, one way that photographers sold their cabinet card distributors was they would make miniature versions of each of the pictures and paste them into. Um, so there are some I've seen from, from Benjamin Falk, who's well represented in the acting out show. Some of his cabinet, his, his pages survive and Jose Maria Mora, but Cerrone's seem all to have disappeared. He, um, his, his negatives were sold. He had ill health at the end of his life and his negatives were sold um, actually to the Borough Giles Lithographic Company that he triumphed over in the Supreme Court. And um, they seem, everything seems to have just disappeared at some point in the 1930s. So the greatest repository of his stuff is in the Harvard Theater Collection and the Harvard Fine Art Library. Excellent. Um, okay, one other question about Cerrone. Um, Britt argued for the business dimension of photography and Aaron about Cerrone's artistic pretensions. How would each of you square the differences between your emphasis? Is this the difference between their markets? Um, so does the cabinet card not discern, determine something about photo itself? I mean, I, I think that's a really fascinating question that, get, that gets at the nub of this strange moment in photographic history. And I think why it's not remembered better. Um, in, in, my, in my opinion, the the commercial side of things and the artistic side of things just weren't separated at all. And, you know, I, I spent some time trying to think about how to, how to present Cerrone as just being an artist, but I think his, his business acumen was a part of his art. As you think of, you know, a modern artist like Andy Warhol was too, or it, that, that was part of what he was going for. Um, so I, I do think it's a part of the cabinet card phenomenon that's important. And, um, but I'm not sure I could really separate those two things. I, I think the business is a big part of it, but there, there was a creative aspect to that kind of entrepreneurship too. 
I also wanted to, in response to that question, bring up the, um, the matter of taste at the time. And one thing I didn't um, have time to get into in my talk, but um, thought about in the larger essay was um, the dialogue that had to happen between the photographer and the client, where there wasn't kind of, you weren't getting that fancy brand of Cerrone and you weren't necessarily a professional performer. So there, they had to negotiate kind of what the um, happy medium was going to be with what the photographer might suggest and what the client wanted. And um, that uh, in the journals, you see kind of reflections of that um, from the photographer's point of view, um, portrait aesthetics. And there was frequently a variation on this theme of the, um, do you have to choose between a photograph that's like but not pretty or pretty but not like the sitter you know so resemblance and kind of beautification come into it you have a lot of debates about retouching um about um you know variation in pose and gesture and that would be um so so that's kind of how i get at thinking about the business versus the artistry in that time period for these types of situations the ones i was studying yeah, the other thing that I think about is that um, the art of photography as we think about it today was not something, was not a category that people thought about for much of the 19th century. You had shows and expositions, there were awards for better photographs and so on. Largely those awards were for technical finesse, some for composition and lighting and so on and so forth. But in, in the sense of Art as we think of it in muse museum presentations of photographs um, was a different kind of discussion that developed really at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. Okay, another topic we've had quite a few conversation or questions about um, is the, the relationship between celebrity and photographer. Um, one of the questions, uh, what types of financial relationships developed between celebrities and photographers who took their likenesses? Um, well, I can, I can jump in with this one. I, that, it's, a, it's a great question. And you know, clearly today there's more of a sense of publicity rights and we know just from the way that celebrity pervades all aspects of our media that um, this is a big business. And people were really just beginning to grasp that in the 19th century. Celebrity was really new. And I think the photographic market and things like cabinet cards were a major driving force behind early celebrity. Um, but Cerrone was famous for, um, for paying his celebrities huge amounts of money at the time um, to, to pose for pictures. He paid um, Fanny Kemble who was a big star at the time, something like $4,000. And Sarah Bernhardt, he paid $1,500 to have exclusive rights to her photos. And Lily Langtree, he paid $500. And this, was, this would be in the newspapers. So it was partially about um, this grand expenditure was another way to generate publicity for the pictures and to stoke interest. Few subjects actually um, honored the exclusivity, um, you know, which is fine because Cerrone didn't really play ball in an honorable way either. So it was kind of a free for all, but the, you know, the financial aspects of it, it was this way of stoking more interest. And so some, some uh, celebrities would, would be paid for the rights, but people um, like Oscar Wilde, who are relatively unknown, it was, um, it's a little unclear what that arrangement was. I've heard different things from different people, but I, uh, my understanding is that he, his, um, the people who had organized his tour reached out to Cerrone and waived any fee because they felt that they could, they could gain publicity for Wilde by having Cerrone make his photographs. So there was a perceived value on the side of the subject and the photographer. Um, though often the photographer benefited the most because they were the ones who got to control the negatives and then be paid for reprints and selling pictures. Okay, great. I, I think that's going to have to be our last question as we run out of time this evening. Uh, I know we weren't able to answer all of the amazing and wonderful questions that um, people have submitted in the Q&A, but uh, for, for any lingering questions that you may have, I encourage you to uh, come check out the uh, Acting Out exhibition at the Eamon Carter. 
Uh, it's open until November 1st and we are following CDC guidelines and open at a percentage of capacity. So we hope you'll visit and um, stay safe. And uh, if you have any lingering questions, um, feel free to send me an email at publicprograms at cartermuseum.org. Um, but thank you all again so much for joining us and thanks so much, Aaron, Brett, and John. This was a wonderful program and I, I wish we could have been together in person, but uh, I'm glad we could still have this program and learn from your expertise. Thank you all. Thank you, Madeline. Okay. Thank you and thank you everybody for joining us.